His Eminence Metropolitan Larian will be with us shortly, but we're going to begin. Again, I want to welcome everyone participating in this conference. Uh, virtually, we have a little over 600 people uh, who have registered for this conference. We certainly all enjoyed ourselves last evening. Uh, and today, we're looking for a bit of a marathon, uh, but that's what we do. Uh, one of our participants, uh, Father George Parsinios, won't be able to join us today. Um, so we're actually going to expand a couple of the f first two papers uh, to assist us, with, particularly with those who are participating virtually, so there's not blank space for them. So as I said, we have a little over 600 people who are joining us today, literally from around the world. It's a very global conference. Uh, we have one participant online who is watching from hospice care. Uh, it was very important for that person, and we want to assure uh, our friend in hospice care and his family of our prayers at this time, and we hope that this event brings light and joy to you and all of us gathered here in person and online. May God be with us. The SVS press table, of course, is open uh, for business, as is the bookstore throughout the day. Uh, th this evening, uh, we'll be wrapping up um, with a reception, and there'll be, again, a, a time for formal book signing and other things during the day. Today is also, of course, a fundraiser for the seminary that allows us to put great conferences like this one together. Um, we already have numerous sponsors, and I want to call your attention to them particularly the Grace and Mercy Foundation, the Orthodox Vision Foundation, Dr. Charles and Mary Lee Agilat, their son Richard Agilat, who happens to be the president of the Alumni Association here, trustees Dr. Don and Sue Tamalonis, His Eminence Metropolitan, Melchizedek Archbishop of Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania, uh, who actually is the underwriter for volume five of the six volume series in the Jesus Christ series that we're all celebrating and honoring today. For those of you who are online and would like to make a donation to support the conference, um, I direct you back to the website and you'll find an easy place for you to make that donation. For the rest of you, there are envelopes scattered around in all kinds of places. Take one, take it home, take one and share it with your neighbor and tell them what a great time you had here and that they ought to be supporting conferences just like this one. I want to introduce uh, our speakers all together Last night, we were able to introduce His Eminence, and today, in one swoop, I'm going to introduce, really, a bevy of scholars that it's going to be a great privilege today to be hearing their different presentations. First is a good friend of mine, um, Garwood Anderson, who is the Dean and Professor of N New Testament at Neshota House Theological Seminary in Neshota, Wisconsin. He also taught at as a visiting professor at Bethel Theological Seminary, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, the Reformed Theological Seminary, and the West African Theological Seminary in Lagos, Nigeria. A committed teacher and frequent retreat speaker, Anderson was recognized with Asbury Theological Seminary's 2006-2007 Excellence in Teaching and Learning Award. His research interests center especially on narrative approaches to reading the Gospels, the parables of Jesus, Pauline's Soteriology and the Theological Appropriation of the New Testament. Welcome, Dr. Anderson. John Barnett is the Associate Professor of New Testament at St. Vladimir's, where he also teaches courses in Biblical Greek. He completed his doctoral studies at Duke University under the direction of Professor Dan Ovia. Barnett's published writings include Paul's reception of the gift from Philippi, And he's also, um, having spent a decade in administrative work here at St. Vladimir's, I know is falling back in love with one of his passions, which is Matthew's Gospel. Bruce Beck is the Assistant Professor of New Testament at Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in Brookline, Massachusetts, and Director of the Religious Studies Program at Hellenic College. Beck received his MDiv and THD at Harvard Divinity School where his area of specialization was New Testament and early Christianity and the history of the interpretation of Scripture. His teaching in the area of New Testament bridges the academic study of the Bible 
with the practical arts of interpreting it in useful ways for the life of the church today. His written work was, has highlighted the ways in which liturgical hymnology and patristic homilies can be potent sources for the history of interpretation of scripture. Carl Holliday is Professor Emeritus of New Testament at Candler School of Theology, Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. He taught at Candler and in Emory's Graduate Division of Religion from 1980 to 2019 and is a popular lecturer at colleges and universities around the world. Holliday's research joins classical academic scholarship and professional application focusing on Luke Acts, Hellenistic Judaism, Judaism in the Greco-Roman world, and Christology. His scholarly contributions have focused on the ways in which the culture of the Hellenistic world shaped Jewish traditions in the, sacred, in the Second Temple period and through them the development of early Christianity. Edith Humphrey is the William F. Orr Professor Emerita of New Testament at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary and a member of St. Nicholas Parish McKees Rocks, Pittsburgh. She earned her doctorate from McGill University, Montreal, for which she received the Governor General's Gold Medal. Before taking her position in Pittsburgh, she lectured at several Canadian universities, serving as Dean of Augustine College, Ottawa, while also serving as music director and organist for St. George Anglican Church, Ottawa. Since her retirement in January 2021, she has continued to teach in various milieu, write, and speak frequently in Christian and academic contexts. She is the author of numerous articles and nine books on topics as diverse as apocalypses, worship, Christian spirituality, human sexuality, and C.S. Lewis. That last book, by the way, is published by SVS Press. Craig Keener is the F. M. and Ada Thompson Professor of Biblical Studies at Asbury Theological Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky. He has authored 28 books, six of which have won awards in Christianity Today, of which altogether more than one million copies are in circulation. The NIV Cultural Background Study Bible, for which Keener authored most of the New Testament notes and which he co-edited, won Bible of the Year in 2017 Christian Book Awards and also won Book of the Year in the Religion, Christianity category of the International Book Awards. He also has written for various journals, including the Journal for the Study of New Testament and Christianity Today. Gregory Sterling is the Reverend Henry L. Slack Dean of Yale Divinity School and is Lillian Claus Professor of New Testament. He assumed the deanship in 2012 after more than two decades at the University of Notre Dame. Concentrating his scholarship in Hellenistic Judaism and early Christianity, Sterling is the author or co-editor or co-editor of eight books and more than 100 scholarly articles and essays. He's held numerous leadership positions in the Society of Biblical Liturgy and the Catholic Biblical Association. James Buchanan Wallace is chair and professor of the Department of Religion and Philosophy at Christian Brothers University in Memphis, Tennessee. He has also taught at Candler School of Theology and the St. Nicholas Orthodox Academy in Atlanta, Georgia. Wallace's research interests include patristic interpretations of scripture and the Greco-Roman and Jewish religious context of early Christianity. He, also has he is also fascinated by heavenly ascent traditions of the ancient world. Wallace is a subdeacon in the Orthodox Church in America and occasionally serves as a guest speaker on Eastern Orthodox Christian theology and spirituality. So you can see we're in for a great day of lectures and presentations. There'll be the presentations in three different groups. At the end of each of those presentations, there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers with the panelists here in the front. So I think we're close to being on time, and I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Carl Holliday. Good morning. First, a word of appreciation to Father Chad and to his staff for organizing this conference and for the event last evening, and also, of course, to Metropolitan Larian for providing the uh, occasion uh, for this conference. We're delighted to be here and look forward to our time together today. Any critical assessment of Metropolitan Larian's sixth volume, Jesus Christ, 
his life and teachings, must take into account the stated purpose as outlined in the opening pages. Rather than being seen as an exercise in formulating or clarifying Christian doctrine, its explicit purpose is to engender faith. The work is written with a well-informed awareness of the secular age in which we live and the recognition that while certain segments of society throughout the world are familiar with the Bible, many people in the world are not. The Metropolitan once explained that in talking with one of his Russian parishioners, he mentioned the title of his work to her, Jesus Christ, His Life and Teachings, to which she responded, Do you mean that Jesus actually had teachings? The sad reality is that biblical illiteracy of this sort is widespread throughout modern society. While our discussion will no doubt focus on different facets of the Metropolitan's four volumes that have now been translated into English and surface questions relating to critical methodologies in current and past biblical scholarship, we must remember that the overall aim of this ambitious project is to inform a reading public that is largely, if not entirely, unfamiliar with the story of Jesus of Nazareth, and even less familiar or unaware of the extensive multifaceted scholarly debate about the historical Jesus that has occupied scholars for almost 300 years. So as we engage in our discussion of this work on Jesus, we do well to ask not simply about the scholarly underpinnings of this investigation, or even the broad scholarly framework within which it is set, but also whether the overall work, the finished architectural building, if you will, achieves its stated purpose of informing the general, non-specialist reader, the interested inquirer, in a way that's coherent and intellectually responsible, given the widely accepted canons of biblical and theological scholarship currently operative in our time. In my remarks, I focus mainly on volume one, the beginnings of the gospel, since it lays the foundation for the entire project. I'm especially intrigued by the way in which the rationale for the project is conceived vis-a-vis certain trends within 19th and 20th century European biblical scholarship. I offer some observations, mostly in the form of notations or questions, that are intended to suggest possible ways of reformulating a particular point or expanding the discussion in a way that might clarify some aspect of the discussion. While my remarks may reflect sharp disagreement at times, they're nevertheless intended to spark debate and constructive conversation that might benefit us all in our respective roles as biblical scholars, theologians, and clerics. I turn first to Metropolitan Alarian's survey of the search for the historical Jesus and his kerygma, his preaching. While identifying some of the, some of the major figures, Ramaras, F.C. Bauer, David Friedrich Strauss, Renan, Tolstoy, Harnack, and Bultmann, some of the methodological innovations, form, tradition, and redaction criticism, and some flawed, innovative efforts, the Jesus Seminar, this section has some conspicuous gaps. The Renaissance is rightly seen as marking a shift in the way in which Jesus is portrayed artistically. But the main catalyst for change is said to have occurred in the Protestant Reformation, with Martin Luther as the main advocate 
for dismissing church tradition and reading scripture critically, sola scriptura. But for example, Luther's rejection of the letter of James should be seen not as an entirely new impulse within the church, but as the reactivation of earlier impulses. Theodore of Mopsuestria, for example, the eminent Antiochian exegete, and in some ways the most influential proponent of literal interpretation as represented by the school of Antioch, rejected several Old Testament writings, Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah, along with some New Testament writings, the Catholic epistles, especially James. Although Theodore was condemned by the Second Council of Constantinople in 553, his critical assessment of various biblical writings had antecedents in the church's debates about limits of the canon in the third and fourth centuries. Rejecting certain New Testament writings on theological grounds was a well-established practice in various regions of the church by the end of the fourth century. And here, of course, I have in mind that the controversies about Hebrews, the authorship of Hebrews, and of the apocalypse. <clears throat> Given the extraordinary influence of Albert Schweitzer's quest of the historical Jesus, especially the second edition, which appeared in 1913, that finally appeared in a complete English translation in the year 2000. This monumental book deserves some attention, however cursory. John Hayes, my Emory colleague of blessed memory, once suggested that Schweitzer's quest was arguably the most influential theological book written in the 20th century. And of course, that's a debatable proposition, but it exercised immense influence. Among other things, Seitzer's book illustrates the multifaceted dimensions of the quest and how its participants could engage in sharp, polemical critique of their predecessors. For example, Spicer characterized Vreda's Messianic Secret, his book on Mark, as thoroughgoing skepticism. And in one memorable passage, Schweitzer writes as follows. The evangelist Mark is supposed, according to Breda, to have been compelled by community theology to represent Jesus as thinking dogmatically, i.e., the post-Easter Jesus, uh, post-Easter churches ascribing messianic status to Jesus retroactively and actively making history, by which he meant innovative claims about the coming kingdom of God. But if the poor evangelist can make him do it on paper, Schweitzer wrote, i.e. portraying Jesus' claim to be the Messiah, the Son of God, etc., why should not Jesus have been quite capable of doing it himself? So, Schweitzer could offer withering critique of uh, scholars like Breda and uh, advance the discussion in that straightforward, polemical way. But calling the end, the quest at the end of the 19th century, quote, a fiasco, and on page 45, fails to acknowledge, I think, the revisionist constructive efforts of post-Boltmanians such as Erich Kesemann, Günter Bornkam, Hans Kanselmann, among others. It also ignores the seminal work of a wide range of scholars, uh, such as Niels Dahl, a Norwegian, Leander Keck, both of whom taught at Yale for a number of years. And it should also be noted that throughout the period of the quest, there were various streams of research rationalistic to different degrees. 
It was an immensely complicated quest. In other European countries, and even in Germany itself. And here I simply mention the work of Martin Kaler during that conversation. Metropolitan Larian's own characterization of conscientious historical critical method, and this is on page 47, is well stated. And he endorses the method a point reiterated and elaborated later in the book, pages 165 to 170. But it should be remembered that the term critical in itself implies rational analysis. Acknowledging the validity of recent research by Roman Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant scholars is a welcome affirmation and Richard Balkan's call for acknowledging the Gospels themselves as the primary mode of accessing the reality of Jesus, in a sense, restates Martin Kaler's position, calling for a more sympathetic reading of the canonical Gospels as reliable witnesses to Jesus' life and teachings, echoes the sentiments of numerous recent scholars, such as Graham Stanton, Eugene Limsko, among others. On the whole then, Metropolitan Alarion affirms the value of historical critical research of the Gospels and of Jesus' studies more broadly. And this is a welcome invitation to biblical scholars, regardless of their confessional or denominational stances. And I think this this needs to be acknowledged that that conversation is opened in the Metropolitan's discussion of Jesus. But I want to flag one concern that relates to how I see the overall discussion of the historical Jesus and the way it is framed. This pertains to the interpretive categories that Metropolitan Hilarion uses to frame the discussion and to evaluate the work of particular scholars. And here I have in mind the binary analytical categories or interpretive issues, uh, interpretive lenses, if you will, that are used throughout the work, especially in reviewing developments within biblical criticism, but also in analyzing the contemporary situation in which biblical scholarship is now carried out. Contrasting rationalist with supernaturalist is a recurrent feature of the historical Jesus section. Protestant scholars of the 18th century, quote, refused to see anything supernatural in Jesus, page 37. David Friedrich Strauss was, quote, a positivist and an extreme rationalist, page 38. Renan took a strictly rationalistic position, refusing to grant the possibility of anything supernatural in life. Rationalist also describes Tolstoy, Harnack, and Bultmann. Even so, Metropolitan Hilarion acknowledges that practically all rational theories of the origin of Christianity have receded into the past. Also, that there's been a retreat from the extremes of rationalism and a turning toward the tradition of the church as an important source for interpreting Jesus. His use of dichotomous categories, for example, traditional and liberal, also occurs at the conclusion of volume two. It's possible, he writes, very conditionally, and that's an important uh, qualification, it's, it's possible very conditionally to divide all existing versions of Christianity into two large groups, traditional and liberal. The chasm that exists today does not so much divide Orthodox and Catholic or Ortho or Catholics and Protestant as much as traditionalists and liberals. Specific controversial topics, including views on homosexuality and abortion, are offered as examples of contrasting theological perspectives that cut across 
denominational lines. But it's worth asking if this binary, whether articulated as rationalist versus supernaturalist or traditionalist versus liberal, is sufficiently nuanced to interpret the complex, multidimensional expressions of Christianity found in today's world. One of the compelling features of Schweitzer's penetrating analysis of the historical Jesus debate, beginning with Ramaras in the late 18th century and moving forward to the early 20th century, is his avoidance of such interpretive binaries. He characterizes Ramaras as a rationalist, which indeed he was, but he doesn't use that as the single category with which to interpret every participant in the historical Jesus debate. He could criticize Vereda for his thoroughgoing skepticism without placing him on one side of a line that separated rationalist from supernaturalist. So the main question here, and perhaps we can discuss this in the panel discussion, Bruce, the main question is whether these two interpretive categories or these two interpretive lenses are sufficient. Are they sharp enough? Are they nuanced enough to explain and to deal with the complexities of the situations we currently face? The Metropolitan Alarian makes this proposal very conditionally, volume two, page 409. And this carefully worded concession leaves the door open, I think, for further debate. And it's a welcome opening for finding interpretive categories suitably complex for constructive analysis and interconfessional dialogue. So here I want to give some reflections on particular issues in the later sections of volume one, and I'll sort of tick through these. In the discussion of the sources, a chapter of over 100 pages, it's about 120 pages, Metropolitan Alarian treats a series of critical issues. One of the first is this questioning of Mark and priority. The view that Mark was the earliest gospel and that it was used as a literary source by Matthew and Luke. And also his skepticism about the existence of Q, the hypothetical saying source that Matthew and Luke used in addition to Mark. And he spoke to this last evening. But with respect to Mark and priority, it's worth noting that scholarly efforts to see Mark as earlier than Matthew and Luke are traceable to the 18th century. J.B. Coppa, 1782. The use of Mark by Matthew and Luke was proposed by G.C. Storr, 1786, and argued independently. This is interesting. It was argued independently by C.G. Vilka and C.H. Weiss in 1838. So they came to this conclusion independently of each other. This hypothesis was debated extremely extensively throughout the 19th century, especially in Europe. So to suggest that the entire discussion of Q is based on nothing more than guesses and presuppositions, page 62, and that there's increasing scholarly sentiment to see Q as, quote, nothing more than a phantom invented by scholars in my view, overstates and oversimplifies an immensely complicated problem that has occupied a vast number of scholars of various confessional backgrounds representing different methodological approaches. As for literary interdependence among the Gospels, it's simply worth remembering that Luke 1, 1 to 4 acknowledges previous attempts to construct an account of Jesus' life and teachings. The Lucan preface also implies that the author has consulted and probably used these previous efforts in constructing his account 
thus making the notion of literary dependence and even independence among the gospel writers a plausible hypothesis based upon what's stated in the Gospel of Luke itself. Moreover, the nature and extent of verbatim or near verbatim duplicate or triplicate accounts within the gospel tradition is difficult to explain without positing some form of literary interdependence. And again, we can talk about this some more. Now, to be sure and to be fair, scholars have recently questioned the way in which gospel studies have focused almost exclusively on scribal activity, that is, activity in which scribes are using written text, either as sources or to compare with each other. In other words, an essentially textual activity. And some have called for a broader perspective in analyzing the Gospels, one in which oral transmission of Gospel materials is given more serious consideration. Uh, James D.G. Dunn, for example, in his presidential address at the SNTS meeting in Durham, called for moving away from an exclusively scribal or textual theoretical model. And this is a useful corrective, and I think the Metropolitan's suggestion about thinking about the gospel tradition in that way dovetails with recent um, efforts to open up the categories with which we analyze gospel text. In the Metropolitan's discussion of the demythologizing of New Testament scholarship, myth is obviously a pejorative term, uh, basically equivalent to a mistake or even to a hoax. It would be less polemical, in my view, to employ the term hypothesis, which is widely used in scientific and other scholarly circles to indicate a working thesis that everybody recognizes as provisional and even debatable. Every serious scholar I know recognizes that Q is a hypothetical document derived by inference from other hypotheses such as mark and priority and literary interdependence. And one of the persons who acknowledges this is John Kloppenborg himself, who edited the critical edition of Q. So in Kloppenborg's book on excavating Q, in the first chapter he has a long discussion of the way in which hypotheses function in modern scientific discourse. That an hypothesis is developed, it's proposed, it's tested, it's discussed in the scholarly literature, and it helps to form a working consensus or not. That's the, that's the nature within which scholarly work, particularly scientific work, is done. So this question is always open for discussion, and the Metropolitan is correct. Uh, a number of scholars have offered alternative views, uh, the Griesbach hypothesis or the two gospel hypothesis or the Ferrer hypothesis. So these are open questions. And the same is true with the Thiosanir debate, uh, the notion of gospels addressing individual communities rather than being addressed to the church at large, which Richard Balcom has proposed in his work. It's true that in the hands of some scholars, these hypotheses tend to become dogmatic assumptions without the necessary qualifications. And I think the Metropolitan is right to call our hand when that happens. But there are some notable exceptions. Even so, reminding readers, particularly readers who are unfamiliar with the technical aspects of scholarly debate, that these are constructs, that they're just that, they're, sco they're scholarly constructs, is a salutary reminder. But, as we all know, scholarly hypotheses are commonly used and accepted in biblical scholarship and in other forms of scholarship. 
For example, the suggestion that Mark and Luke were among the 70, this is a statement on page 440, is a scholarly hypothesis or a reasonable deduction. It's not stated in the text, but it's a reasonable deduction to, to include these two among the 70. Similarly, assigning the gospels, the canonical gospels, to named individuals is a working hypothesis. As they stand, the gospels are anonymous. And there's a broad scholarly agreement, uh, Hengel notwithstanding, we, we simply disagree on this, that the titles are assigned to each gospel later, probably in the second century. So when we speak confidently of Matthew as the author of the first gospel, we're saying more than what's said in the gospel itself. We, we all know that the gospels tend to reduce or eliminate the identity of the author. So the same is true with the beloved disciple in the, gospel, in the fourth gospel. While traditions about the authorship of the fourth gospel developed early and were elaborated over time by various church fathers, these are nevertheless later traditions that are now considered by some as dogmas. So the, the use of and the way we think about scholarly hypotheses in um, the assumptions with which we read the text, I think, is um, a topic for debate and for open discussion because it's a critical in, uh, uh, issue, it seems to me, in the discussion today. Now I want to mention some examples from the Metropolitan's own critical reading of the Gospels. His discussion of the problem of the two genealogies, the genealogy in Matthew 1 and in Luke, in chapter 3, squarely confronts the differences between Matthew and Luke, adducing the ways in which Africanus, uh, John Damascene, John Chrysostom, St. Simeon, the new theologian, understood these differences, helpfully shows how the fathers grappled with these interpretive challenges. Sections 4 to 10 in that same chapter also exhibit these same strengths, candidly admitting the interpretive difficulties created by substantial differences between Matthew and Luke with regard to the geographical details given by Matthew and Luke relating to Jesus' birth, the Metropolitan concedes, quote, it is impossible, no matter how, we, how much we wish, to completely harmonize the accounts of the two evangelists. And it seems to me he speaks for every scholar who has tried to work out the details of the birth and infancy of Jesus in Matthew and Luke. But even so, this admission is illuminated, I think, by his rehearsal of how the church fathers, such as Augustine, dealt with these issues. And again, I think one of the benefits of the entire six volumes is the degree to which the patristic tradition is introduced to help amplify the way in which the story of Jesus is understood. But on the whole, I think his methodological approach represents a, re a maximalist reading of the gospel in which the details reported by each evangelist are taken mostly at face value and then fused into a single account wherever possible. And this represents an alternative uh, approach, for example, by Raymond Brown and others who've worked on the uh, birth and infant scenarios to see the Matthean and Lucan accounts as independent, theologically shaped narratives that give distinctive, albeit theologically complementary, accounts of the birth of the Messiah. Also commendably critical is the Metropolitan's treatment of the temptation and the various ways it's reported in the Synoptic Gospels. Once again, candid admission of the historical difficulties arising from these accounts is welcome, he writes. The very way in which the material is presented 
prompts us to perceive this story not as an historical account, but as a portrayal of a singular spiritual experience that Jesus had in the wilderness and which was a consequence of his extended fast. And then his theological exposition of the temptations reported by both Matthew and Luke is especially rich in my view. Not only in getting at what is at stake in each temptation experientially and theologically, but also in drawing on Dostoevsky and Pope Benedict XVI to tease out how these two accounts of Jesus' temptation address fundamental human conflicts experienced by people in every age and situation. Similarly provocative is the exposition of Jesus' understanding of the kingdom of God. So I think these are two places in volume one where the interested inquirer, the the non-specialist reader, would be addressed directly and could constructively understand the gospel tradition in ways that would connect with their own life whatever their situation happens to be. In the first section of chapter 5, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee, the discussion of the Old Testament prophets is a compact summary of the relevant Old Testament evidence pertaining to prophecy. The discussion of the end of the prophetic era, when, quote, there were no more prophets in Israel, reflects the old view that prophetic voices disappeared or ceased or went silent in the 4th through the 1st century BCE. This this view was informed by such texts as 1 Maccabees 4.16-1441, suggesting a prophetic hiatus in the time before Christ. But since the early 20th century, scholars have increasingly recognized the frequency and prominence of apocalyptic speculations, many of them in the form of prophetic utterances during the centuries immediately preceding the Christian era. To be sure, the the age of the classical Old Testament prophets was over, but claims about the diminution or even the cessation of prophecy before the turn of the era now require further nuance by taking into account the widespread impact of Jewish apocalyptic thinking and activity during the Second Temple period. So the discussion of prophecy, I think, in this section is helpful, but it also needs to be supplemented with with recent scholarship on apocalyptic traditions. The same is true of the section that depicts Jesus as a prophet. And what happens in this section is that what each of the Gospels reports about Jesus' prophetic status tend to be fused. And what's lost there, I think, is the way in which Luke takes the image of Jesus as prophet and sharpens it and elevates it in a way that neither Mark nor Matthew does. And so by fusing the accounts, we sometimes lose the the distinctive element of a particular portrayal in one of the Gospels. So I think that's what's at stake there. So um, I think there are other examples that I've indicated in my paper. Let me mention one more, one more and then I'll conclude. The portrayal of Jesus' opponents in chapter 7 is admittedly selective, singling out the various groups mentioned in the Gospels and reporting what we know, especially from Josephus, And this pertains to the Pharisees and the Sadducees in particular. But the assertion that the Cornelius episode illustrates the radical break of early Christianity with the Jewish tradition requires some qualification. Among other reasons, because the Jesus movement from its inception was essentially Jewish in outlook along with Paul. And recent scholarship on Jewish Christianity, along with the ongoing debate about the parting of the ways, 
suggests that the break between the church and the synagogue was not as clean as is sometimes supposed. In chapter 8, Jesus, the way of life and character traits, one of the opening sentences is especially well formulated. Each gospel, the Metropolitan writes, presents Jesus in its own way, examining his life and activity from its own characteristic perspective. And I think that's on target, and that's precisely one of the ways in which we can pursue gospel studies meaningfully for the life of the church and for the life of uh, unbelievers, if you will. So in conclusion, as I said at the beginning of my remarks, Metropolitan Alarian's six-volume magnum opus must be judged in light of its stated purpose to introduce a broad range of non-specialist readers to the historical figure, Jesus of Nazareth, and to show how the canonical gospels and early church tradition constitute the best and the most reliable sources for understanding the church's faith in Jesus as a plausible, compelling claim, a claim that's worthy of serious consideration for anyone living in a highly secular context. Thank you. So we have a little bit of time here. Um, Professor Edith is also going to have a little bit of extended time. So we can make some adjustments, I think, in the, in the schedule, being sensitive to the large number of people who are in front of screens participating today. So I'm going to actually ask uh, Metropolitan Hilarion to come up. He has a few words he would also like to say. But keep in mind that we'll try to stay on target for the question and answer time with the, the two panelists at 10.35 a.m. So your eminence, uh, your words now, and then we'll be hearing from uh, Professor Edith Humphrey, who will be speaking on the right time and the fullness of time, timefulness in orthodox interpretations of scripture. Your eminence. It is much easier to discuss someone's book when the author is either absent or is already dead. <laughs> Since I belong to neither of these categories, uh, I uh, just want to make a few comments. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Holliday for uh, his very careful uh, reading of uh, my first volume and also for the cooperation which we have established among each other, in particular in the uh, preparation of the conferences on New Testament studies, which we organize in Moscow. And Professor Holiday has been a key figure in um, assembling scholars for these conferences. My initial plan was to organize uh, a, uh, one conference per year, starting with Matthew, then going to Mark, and then going to Luke. And then uh, I calculated this, uh, that uh, if we go with the same speed, then it will suffice more or less until my retirement with all the New Testament books. But uh, the pandemic uh, made us to slow this pace, so we are now between Mark and Luke, uh, looking forward to the conference on Luke, which I hope will take place next year. Um, Professor Holliday uh, indicated uh, some gaps in my presentation of the New Testament scholarship, and of course there are many gaps, and it was not intended that uh, some kind of uh, comprehensive survey of the development of the New Testament scholarship should be given in this volume. Otherwise, I would have uh, produced a single volume on the New Testament scholarship. Maybe eventually I, I will do this, uh, 
but then uh, the sixth volume collection will be transformed into uh, the seventh volume collection. And then the subsequent volumes will have to be renumbered. Um, I am grateful for the distinction between uh, hypotheses and myths. And I think uh, the uh, object of my attacks in this introductory section is precisely myths, not hypotheses. I am personally inclined, inclined to take very seriously the hypothesis of the Markan priority because I think it is a very sound hypothesis, at least in relation to many passages in the Synoptic Gospels. Once, however, the hypothesis becomes a dogma, then I would disagree with this. If uh, a study of the Gospel text proceeds from uh, the concept of uh, Markan priority, as something given, as something not non-disputable, as uh, no longer a hypothesis, but a fact, then with this approach I disagree. And I tried to indicate this in my book. Uh, with regard to the Gospel of Luke, on page 104, I uh, mentioned, of course, that he was not the first evangelist and that he refers to other evangelists, which means that he was uh, familiar not only with uh, various segments of the oral tradition about Jesus, but also with some written documents, whether these documents uh, were already existing in the form of complete gospels or in the form of uh, fragments, which later were assembled uh, in the gospel texts. My idea of demythologizing the New Testament scholarship uh, clearly proceeds from the term demythologizing, which I uh, took from uh, the um, New Testament uh, tendency to demythologize the Gospels. And uh, I here simply play with the words. I believe that the New Testament scholarship itself became full of myths and of dogmas which we have to um, assess critically. My dissatisfaction with the Q source is uh, based on a very clear fact that this source has never been discovered. You mentioned uh, John Kloppenburg and his uh, phrase excavating uh, Q. Well, when you excavate somewhere, you either find something or you don't find something. You may find a coin or you may find an artifact or you may find something else. Once you found this, you can publish it. You can display it. You can put it in a museum. But if you didn't find anything, then of course uh, to produce uh, a critical edition of something which was not really excavated, which was not found, is for me just a very misleading uh, idea, a very misleading hypothesis. Again, uh, I am not opposed to uh, a hypothesis of the existing of the Q as one of many hypotheses. But once it becomes a dogma, once it becomes a basis for uh, theological research around the Gospels, then I think I uh, strongly oppose this idea. And I uh, think that uh, when speaking of the Q source, we always have to say that it is not really a source, it is an imaginary source. It is a source which uh, most likely never existed. And I think many scholars in recent times uh, came to the same conclusion. And my final remark concerns uh, the two uh, genealogies which I discuss in my book. Of course, uh, uh, this is a very complicated subject and uh, if you want to discuss it thoroughly, you need at least uh, one volume just for the two gene genealogies. Uh, my idea here was to present a hypothesis which I uh, made in this book.
namely that the two genealog genealogies proceed, proceed from two initial sources, and that one genealogy is based on one witness, and another genealogy is based on another witness. And I argue that for Luke's genealogy, it was the Holy Virgin, the Mother of God, who was the initial source. How this information was transmitted to uh, future generations, this is another story. And here we can only um, pr produce hypost uh, hypotheses. But uh, I believe that there are indications in the Lucan account uh, in chapters 1 and 2 that the main source for the information which he gives was the mother of God. Uh, the same is true about Matthew. I believe that uh, the initial source for Matthew's uh, chapters 1 and 2 is uh, Joseph and that the information which is provided in Matthew about his uh, um, decisions, about his dreams, about the appearances of angels to him, uh, may proceed from him and may have been transmitted through the so-called uh, brothers and sisters of Jesus who are mentioned in the Gospels. They are also mentioned in the books, uh, book of Acts, and they played uh, an important role in the early Christian community. So my idea is that uh, these two uh, sources led to two different genealogies and also to two different accounts of the uh, story of the birth uh, and childhood of Jesus Christ. I think I'll stop with this, and I look forward to listening to Edith. Thank you. We'll have Professor Humphrey uh, presenting now. At her conclusion, we will take that break. We'll reassemble to put us back on schedule at 1035 for the panel discussion as is listed in your program. So, Edith. So one of the mixed blessings of my career teaching in a mainline Protestant seminary is that I've been exposed to trends in contemporary Western hymnody. And note I said mixed blessings. Brian Wren, W-R-E-N, is a reformed composer who retired from Columbia Seminary in 2007, about whom someone remarked, he is the most frequently sung hymn writer since Charles Wesley, perhaps in some circles. Here's an example of his work. Christ is alive, let Christians sing. His cross stands empty to the sky. Let streets and homes with praises ring. His love in death shall never die. Christ is alive, no longer bound to distant years in Palestine. He comes to claim the here and now and conquer every place and time. Not decked with gold, remotely high, untouched, unmoved by human pains, but daily in the midst of life our Savior with the Father reigns. In every insult, rift, and war, where color, scorn, or wealth divide, he suffers still, yet loves the more with healing hands and aching side. Christ is alive, his spirit burns through this and every future age, till all creation lives and learns his joy, his justice, love, and praise. This hymn celebrates the risen Lord, his ubiquitous presence through the Holy Spirit, and his concern for our daily lives. At the same time, it ignores the particularity of Jesus' atoning death. It downplays the importance of the Trinity's transcendence, stresses the so-called social gospel over God's call to holiness, to life, and suggests that the historical action of God, the incarnate one, was a limitation, a limitation rather than the focal place where God acted in our world. So let's detail these moves in the hymn. You only have the first verse in front of you, but I'll try to remind you of the others. Jesus suffers still over our political and social divisions. He rules among us and not in the holy place. He was bound to Palestine in his human life, but now he's alive everywhere in the Holy Spirit. 
The hymnodist, I would say, is mostly right in what he affirms, but wrong in what he denies. Certainly our Lord is risen, but he's also ascended. Certainly the Spirit has come, but to complete, not to undo the particularity of the incarnate one. Certainly our Lord continues to be touched by our infirmities and divisions, but his divinity remains unchanged, and his suffering is complete. As he said, it is finished. Certainly Christ is among us, and yet also he is the Holy One to whom we bow the knee. So we might be tempted to stress the garden variety, non-Orthodox problems that we see in this hymn, and maybe some Protestants would make a similar critique, such as its over-familiarity with the Lord. However, perhaps we also glimpse a misperception found even in the Orthodox community as we grapple with time and eternity. And so my talk for today, and I'm very grateful for being asked to come, Father Chad and all of you here, uh, the right time and the fullness of time, timefulness in orthodox interpretation of scripture. So perhaps we're too quick to dismiss the importance of time in favor of the eternal, which we assume to be timeless. Close attention to the diaconal prayer in the proscomedia, that is that solemn preparation for the Eucharist, redirects us though, in the tomb with the body, and in Hades with the soul, in paradise with the thief, and on the cross with the Father and the Spirit, was thou, O boundless Christ, filling all things. Here then is the Lord who fills up time rather than obliterating it. Just as our Lord was plunged into the spatial elements of this world in his baptism and incarnation, so too he has redeemed time, coming at just the right moment, kairos, and in the fullness of time, chronos. And please, Orthodox friends, you can't take the Erasmus out of a girl that was trained in the academy, so don't expect me to do anything else. I just can't. I try and I'll get, I'll get mixed up. Despite the constant direction that is present in the ancient liturgies, it is easy to fall prey to what we might call a temporal docetism, especially as we approach the reading of scriptures. This is complicated by the temptation of some Orthodox in today's closer conversations with Catholic and Protestant friends. That temptation to overstate orthodox distinctions as a means of self-safeguarding identity. Such overreactions occur in ethical, theological, and liturgical matters, but also in how some orthodox theologians have characterized our view of scripture's character. For example, it's become commonplace to assert as a challenge to so-called fundamentalist Christians that the scriptures are only a signpost to the one who is the word of God, but that the sacred books themselves are not God's word. That's an overstatement. Similarly, the claim is frequently made that Orthodox need not enter into Western biblicist and rationalist debates, for they have avoided the infamous Western fall of the Enlightenment. And anyway, in the Bible, we should see timeless truths. The Bible as a timeless document evades the difficulties of historical demonstration in the sense of what really happened. Scripture and ongoing tradition, however, show us that these are at best exaggerations and at worst missteps. After all, Orthodox tradition does not uniformly promote a reading of Scripture that neglects the diachronic, that is, the flow of history as revealed to God's people. So we're going to sketch out in the few moments that we have this morning a description of Scripture's that is neither historicist nor timeless, I hope, but timeful. Perhaps this kind of neologism, timefulness, provides us with a tertium quid, another way that capitulates neither to modernism on the one hand nor to fundamentalism on the other, and that aptly represents how many of the fathers approach their reading and interpretation of the Bible without dismissing time and space. 
Now, of course, many ancient theologians read the scriptures fruitfully by means of allegory, a method that is not dependent upon historical questions. It is, however, often said that the best ancient exegetes did not, even when applying the allegorical method, destroy the natural meaning of the text, not when that meaning had a historical aspect or another realistic focus. This principle remains true even of many bits of exegesis performed by those whom we could call remedial allegorists, that is, those who avoided historical problems in the reading of some Old Testament passages by a turn to allegory. But this morning, we're not going to be reading, we're not going to be probing the exegetical moves of, say, a Clement, a Barnabas, or even the great Origen. Rather, we're going to consider one of the earliest Christian sermons found in Scripture. We're going to look to St. Irenaeus' characterization of the canontes aletheus, the rule of truth or of faith. And we're going to take our cue from Chrysostom and Athanasius, who fastened, those fathers who fastened upon God's actions in history as an integral part of the orthodox hypothesis of Scripture. With these ancient fathers, we'll see three interconnected features, I think. First, an awareness of the importance of sequence. Secondly, a belief that God enters time to bring his plan and our lives to fulfillment. And thirdly, a declaration that all events find their meaning and tell us in the God-man, Jesus, who fully entered human time and space. So we begin with the proto-martyr, Stephen, and the scriptures themselves. Already we find ourselves in the realm of interpretation, don't we? Because Stephen's sermon in Acts, itself a reading of the Hebrew scriptures, is refracted to us through the lens of the evangelist Luke, who places before our eyes and our ears the apostolic approach to scripture modeled by the Lord, or so so Luke has told us, during a 40-day period following the resurrection when he instructed first the two on the road to Damascus and then the disciples in the upper room and presumably beyond that. We may be tempted to think that the Hellenist deacon is simply following following a rhetorical strategy when he appeals to the Hebraic, his to his uh, when he, as he's appealing to his Hebraist detractors. And he does this, we might think, by fastening upon the hypothesis of the Old Testament scriptures. Closer attention shows us that the medium is the message. It's not just a strategy. Indeed, he follows in a long line of biblical credos that rehearse salvation history according to a particular shape and for a particular purpose. And we don't have time to go through those, but I've got a list of about 20 here from Deuteronomy through to Ezekiel. I'm not going to read the excerpt to you from Acts. Um, You have um, excerpted um, on the screen before you. Um, but I am going to point out some of the features. One of the major features of this history lesson is its explicit concern for the passing of time marked in various ways by the adverbs tote, meta, acri, then, after, and until, by the addition of historical details not necessarily germane to the matter of hand, such as the succession of the patriarchs or the reference to a second visit, and by other time markers such as day or days, now, and three times 40 years. Especially pointed are the Greek phrases that accentuate time and its fulfillment. But just as the time, chronos, of the fulfilled promise drew near, or that's chapter 7, verse 17, or chapter 7, verse 20, 20, at which time, Kairos, Moses was born. When for Moses the time, Kronos, of 40 years had been fulfilled, now when the 40 years had been fulfilled. One might have thought that in a discourse that called attention to the heavenly type of the tabernacle, which Stephen is doing, and to the sovereign God who does not dwell in houses made by human hands, one might have thought that the vertical dimension of Revelation would utterly dominate over the horizontal 
over the timeline. But this is not the case. Nor is it true, by the way, in the letter to the Hebrews, though some have mischaracterized the book in that way. No, the vertical dimension of Revelation does not cancel out the horizontal, nor does the heavenly world erase the importance of the earthly. Instead, space and time are filled up, redeemed, given significance, and put to God's service. For this is the Lord of heaven and earth who makes the Sinai rocks holy and who identifies himself as the God of the fathers of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. He does not dwell in houses made with human hands, but he does dwell with humankind whom his divine hands have created. And he meets with them, appearing in glory in Mesopotamia, in Egypt, in the wilderness. The patriarch Moses, to whom Stephen's detractors appealed, is identified as one raised up by God who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with the fathers and who received living oracles to give. God's presence with Moses was palpable in the glory on his face and in signs and wonders and throughout the wilderness wandering. The same presence is palpable now in Stephen, who shines, who pronounces this pointed history lesson, who has done great signs and wonders, and who will recapitulate the death of the righteous one to whom all the prophets pointed. At just the right time when he is about to meet his death, the proto-martyr sees the Son of Man, the great glory, and bears witness to those who did not want, do not want to hear. Eyes and time are filled up with the revelation of God. Luke's point, and Stephen's too, is that the story of Israel and of the world is God's story. Yet this can only be seen from the perspective of the one who has finally come, the one who is the true temple of God, and by whom God's people can be deeply visited. The Torah was indeed ordained by angels and was received by the first community, says the martyr, but the oracles of God are living, and the divine life moves beyond that time to the now in continuity with the past, even while it brings surprises. The God who cannot be seen by humans without death now by his death has forged a way that he can be seen and adored by human eyes in time and space. The wilderness, the imperfect, the impermanent gives way to the permanent. If God will not dwell in our houses, we may dwell in his. All this implied by the proto-martyr. Now, of course, the proto-martyr is interrupted. But the tendencies in his homily are clear, directing us to fill in the blanks, to trace the trajectory as we see in Stephen's martyrdom, the glory of God fully alive in his human vessel, who has the face of an angel and the eyes and mouth of one as well. As the Israelites received Torah through angels, now those hearing and reading the words of the inspired preacher receive something far more precious. The identification of the Son of Man as Jesus, present, present there in great glory, pleading for his own and worthy of worship. St. Stephen's Chronicle, though interrupted, is doing its work. And as he prays for God's welcome and the forgiveness of those who will not yet receive, we could hardly imagine that, the forgive, that what he does and is doing here would eventually make its future mark upon Saul, the so-called least of the apostles. But this is a living oracle, now dwelling in our time and space, and its potency is not exhausted. The historical narrative's respect for sequence, even though it's interrupted, is evident. Its timefulness is potent, and its meaning centers firmly upon the one who made, who entered our temporal world, and who promises to return. It's a shame that we don't have time here to detail the words of Justin Martyr, but I'm going to just mention him before we go on to St. Irenaeus. He traces typology in the Old Testament. 
But he does not spiritualize the law as he does so. Rather, he speaks about God's foreknowledge of the future in his dialogue, section 40. He directs Trypho away from abstract philosophy towards the prophets who concentrated upon the events of salvation history. He details the flow of history in chapters 11 and 12 of his dialogue. And with the creed, he emphasizes Jesus' life and death under Pontius Pilate. What a weird thing to put in the creed if we intend this to be timeless truths. Yes? His approach stands in marked contrast to, for example, the epistle of Barnabas that wholly spiritualizes the Old Testament Torah and that despite its very early popularity, the church saw good reason not to number with the books that corresponded to the rule of truth or faith. Instead, let's move on and consider briefly St. Irenaeus' teaching concerning the canon Aletheus, the canon of truth. And we're going to do that in the light, of course, of his critique of the Gnostics who were rearranged the hypothesis of Scripture. In his Against Heresies, he says they did this by wrenching details out of their initial position, by having no regard for authorial intent, by moving from a natural to a non-natural sense, et to katafusin, eis to parafusin, in their rearrangement of expressions and names in scripture. Indeed, it's important, Irenaeus tells us, in correcting such heretical eisegesis, that we restore to their proper position in the narrative those things that the heretics wrench away from the original fabric for their own purposes. Father John Baer is helpful when he insists that we understand canonicity as including a way of reading and interpreting scripture. St. Irenaeus not only points out that the Valentinians had strange and esoteric doctrines, but he explains that the reason for this is that they've dismissed the canon of truth. Thus demonstrates the saint they do not read the scriptures with the apostolic eye, a perspective that includes their natural arrangement and their presentation of history and dispensations. In moving on from his critique of Valentinian eisegesis, St. Irenaeus also outlines the faith of the church in terms of salvation history, filling out the church's teaching on the Holy Spirit by reference to the dispensations, ecumenia, economia, or dispensationes in the Latin. Also by tracing the historical flow of the apostolic hypothesis from creation to the new creation. He speaks of the time frame of the story, of the different covenants, each with its own special character. It castes ho character its own special character. And he speaks of the astonishing grace of God that the Gentiles, whose salvation was despaired of, have at last come into the household. In Book 2, Section 25, which is extant only in the Latin, he goes on to ask about God's hand in the composition of all things and the ordering of names, entertaining the question that someone might ask, well, are such details really not very important? Are they simply empty in venom. His answer is non quidem, no indeed. Perhaps in the Greek it was the Pauline meganoito, may it not be so, who knows what he said. And then he goes on to speak about times both ancient and current and the importance of approaching the biblical story with rational thought. He goes on to explain that created things in terms of space and time may be viewed as a kind of a musical composition with various points that may appear inharmonious for a moment, contraria et non conventienta, but which when heard in terms of the whole are revealed to be intriguing intervals and suspensions, extensionem, Eventually, they fit into integrity and integrity. They resolved. There are various notes in God's complex melody, each of which has its own special character. Moreover, for all of his keenness to stress the spiritual sacrifice that God demands of us, all the way to book four through book six, he prefaces 
this theological discussion by admitting that the law had its proper place in its own time. It wasn't God's highest will, not his first choice, but it was added for the sake of God's people, rather than because God himself needed animal sacrifice. Again, this is a far cry from the kind of rhetoric that we encounter, say, in a Clement of Alexandria, who denies that the Torah ever intended to actually demand animal sacrifice or kosher eating. St. Irenaeus, on the other hand, does not flatten out the words of God by denying their dynamism, and so he avoids the temporal equivalent to Tatian's diatessaron. So the point is he neither says God didn't act this way in the past, nor does he say there's no difference. He sees the distinction but sees how the two are related. Indeed, despite the strong need to differentiate Christianity from rabbinic Judaism, he admits the propydeutic, the um, pedagogical purpose of the Torah, showing that it pointed to Christ, who is its telos, both its end and its fulfillment. Well, of course, few are going to be surprised that we can speak of St. John Chrysostom in terms of a natural reading of scripture. He's frequently taken as the epitome of the Antiochian school over the Alexandrian penchant for allegorical readings. His sermons and writings are, of course, replete with common sense interpretations of the scripture that do not ignore their historical context. I would like, however, to note the fairly recent challenge now heeded by not a few, by many, regarding what had been a customary scholarly divide between Antioch and Alexandria. And this involves a dismantling, I'm quoting, a dismantling of the older dichotomy between allegorical and literal exegesis. This is described by Mitchell in her heavenly trumpet, though she doesn't agree entirely with this new trend. Scholars such as Francis Young and Christophe Chauvin have suggested that the difference is more between a rhetorical approach in Antioch and a philosophical approach in Alexandria. And they're now speaking of the ahistorical character of Chrysostom's exegesis by explaining that his detailed description of scriptures are really just a rhetorical move. They're not really displaying a sensitivity to context and to history. Well, in this new schema, any purported historical content is supposed to be dismissed as exemplary for the purposes of preaching, virtue, rather than being seen as truly indicative of the saint's concern for time and context. This is a question mark that's being put then between the, the strong dichotomy of Alexandria and at Antiochian methods, and I think it's worth considering. However, close attention to the manner in which St. John Chrysostom depicts the saints may give us pause before we jump entirely on board. The golden mouth is concerned, after all, for what they ate, how they slept. Other historical minutiae by which he displays the biblical characters before our eyes as an example of godliness. In reading scriptures, notably the letters of St. Paul, the golden mouth displays the same devotion to every detail. Indeed, Margaret Mitchell convincingly shows that St. John Chrysostom's rhetorical power and argument depends wholly upon the way that he shows quote from her, St. Paul's historical rootedness in real human existence. So consequently, we can't make this strong dichotomy, as Jung has done, between the historical. St. John Chrysostom isn't historical, she says. He's only exemplary because you need the historical for him to be exemplary. Of course, it's important for us not to impose upon St. John's time our own standards of historical discourse. Raymond Brown, Father Raymond Brown, insisted in commenting upon the nativity story, the narratives in the Gospels, that these demonstrate a separate genre, a genre between historical reportage on the one hand and construction or fantasy or novel on the, uh, on the other. Um, this is a distinct genre, an intermediary between history and pure invention. In the end, we might characterize St. Chrysostom as one who constructs for us a prose interpretation that is a kind akin to the icon 
not abstracting from the scriptural text, but showing its deep significance and how it fills up human time and space to overflowing. As we read the bishop, we see how the Apostle Paul reached out, so to speak, to meet him, and so now reaches out to us. We're reminded of the Golden Mouth's description of the words of Genesis as containing both tiny nuggets of particular treasure and as waters that flowed for our ancestors and overflow for us without our risk of exhausting them from his third homily on Genesis. Scripture both spoke and speaks. He uses both terms. The saints in Scripture both lived in their own time but live and influence us today. For God is the God of the living, not the dead. In the words of Mitchell, John, St. John, wished to stress the very earth and time-boundedness of his flesh and blood human example, even as he depicted Paul as a citizen of heaven. He was concerned with everything from the historically particular moment to its perjuring words for universal readership. So, in his writings and sermons, St. John does not merely collapse the time gap, as some have charged, but he fully recognizes and explicitly bridges it. With St. John Chrysostom, as with the proto-martyr, Justin, uh, the proto-martyr and Justin Martyr and St. Irenaeus, there remains a deep engagement with sequence, a focus upon the God who enters time, and the conviction that all events and persons find their meaning and their telos in the God-man, Jesus. Well, we have no more time, alas, to look more deeply into our golden Mouth father. I'd like to finish by glancing beyond Antioch to Alexandria for an unexpected, if you accept the dichotomy, example of our principles of a time-full approach. I speak of St. John's younger contemporary, St. Athanasius who is more frequently noted for his allegorizing techniques. These are sometimes, to the ears of a contemporary scholar, bizarre allegorical readings that are offered in both his discourses against the Arians and it is more more well known on the Incarnation. On the other hand, one of his major criticisms of the Arian exegetes was the way in which they paid no attention to the context, the topic, the authorial attention, or even who was being addressed in the scriptural text. Moreover, his writings do demonstrate a concern for history in the sense of what really happened. That little word history and historical, they're a little slippery there. So I mean in the sense of what really happened. He cared about that. He doesn't gloss over them or or gloss over the differences. A case in point is his letter 19 in which he speaks about the Feast of Passover and Christian Pascha in these terms. Henceforth, the Feast of the Passover is ours, not that of a stranger, nor is it any longer of the Jews. For the time of shadows is abolished, and those former things have ceased, and now the month of new things is at hand. Here, then, we see our principle of historical events and persons being fulfilled in Christ. But... How does St. Athanasius fill this out? Not by suggesting that the feast of Passover or the sacrifices of the law were not commanded by the Lord to the Jewish people. Rather, that these things were both types and the condescension of God to meet the human condition. In this way, he explains how it is that Jeremiah and Amos can depict God as not commanding burnt offerings to the ancestors when indeed the Torah says that God required these things. Here is his discussion, and he sees this as a problem, attention in scripture. And what does this mean, my brethren? For it's right for us to investigate the sayings of the prophet, and especially on account of heretics who have turned their mind against the law. By Moses, then, God gave the commandments respecting sacrifices, and all the book called Leviticus is entirely taken up with the arrangement of these matters so that he might accept the offerer. Now, it is the opinion of some that the scriptures do not agree with each other or that God who gave the commandment is false. But there's no disagreement whatsoever, for far from it, neither can the Father who is truth lie, for it is impossible that God should lie, as Paul affirms. But all these things are plain to those who rightly consider them and to those who receive with faith the writings of the law. 
Now, his concern here is for the discrepancy between the prophets who say no sacrifice and the law that commands it, and indeed for the disdain that he sees in his own day of those um, around him for the Torah. In offering his solution to the problem, please note now his humble tone, his humility, as he asks for prayers and hopes that his interpretation is correct. He says this, Now it appears to me, may God grant by your prayers that the remarks I presume to make may not be far from the truth. It appears to me that not at first were the commandment and the law concerning sacrifices. His solution, then, is to say that the Torah's explicit commands of ritual and sacrifice were not God's first will. He turns to the flow of time and the sequence of the story in the Torah to demonstrate this. Therefore, the whole law did not treat of sacrifices, he says, though there was in the law a commandment concerning sacrifices, that by means of them it might begin to instruct men and might withdraw them from idols and bring them near to God, teaching them for that present time. Therefore, neither at the beginning, when God brought the people out of Egypt, did he command them concerning sacrifices or whole burnt offerings, or even when they came to Mount Sinai. But when they chose to serve Baal and forgot the miracles which were wrought in their behalf in Egypt, then indeed, after the law, that is the Ten Commandments, that commandment concerning sacrifice was ordained as law, so that their mind, which at one time had meditated on those which are not, they might now turn to him who is truly God and learn not in the first place to sacrifice, but to turn their faces away from idols and conform to what God had commanded. This is important, his final word. Thus then, being instructed and taught, they learned not to do service to anyone but the Lord. They attained to know what time the shadow should last and not to forget the time that was at hand. So St. Athanasius' approach to these matters is helpful. First, he recognizes a problem in scripture, a problem which is felt because he was refusing to allegorize the, allegorize the Old Testament legal requirements as some had done. Secondly, he speaks in full humility, offering his words as a theologumenon, knowing that he is working through a complex matter. Thirdly, he intends in his discussion to give glory to the God of truth, Fourthly, he makes a suggestion that is not clearly demonstrable in the Torah, but at least pays full attention to details and to the historical flow of the story. And fifthly, he demonstrates that in any event, the Old Testament legal requirements were given until the time of refreshment, until the time that is now at hand when Christ has come. This approach, along with that of the proto-martyr Stephen, Justin Martyr, St. Irenaeus and St. John Chrysostom bears out the words of Father John Baer that there is no such thing as uninterpreted history. As those of the household of faith, we were bequeathed not only the scriptures, but an approach to reading these holy books that comes from the Gospels, or from the Apostles, and ultimately from our Lord. However, to say that history comes to us with with interpretation is not necessarily to imply that what happened in time is irrelevant. Father John Baer speaks with concern about modernity's fascination with the past. Yet we must remember that at least since the time of David Hume, there's been a deep suspicion about history in modernity and in postmodernity too. There is an allergy and there's a fear perhaps that all interpretation that's all we have. There's no substance, there's no event, there's no, there's no actual personages as we hear the recorded history. Talk of eternal and timeless truths, I think, plays deep directly into the hands of those who have such allergies and such suspicion about history. History may be only a part of God's mystery, but it matters. And so, to sum up. I'm delighted to speak at a conference which honors the work of his eminence, Hilarion, who does not downplay the importance of history as he handles the Gospels and the stories of Jesus. I was especially pleased to find in his third volume on miracles a faithful analysis which places Jesus' miracles in the context of literature, of orthodox theology, and of history.
It makes my heart sing to see how he illumines our Lord Jesus, fully God and fully human, declaring that the good he brings is not abstract but fully concrete. The incarnation itself shows why time is not irrelevant. Similarly, time matters as we grapple with the epistles. Why is it the Apostle Paul speaks of himself as untimely born? Now, some people wrongly assume, reading only the English, that he's meaning he came after the other apostles. But actually, St. Paul is describing himself rather as uncooked, not fully ready for ministry. Unlike the 12, he hadn't accompanied Jesus throughout his ministry for a period of time. That was the usual means of becoming an apostle because God indeed employs usual methods of human knowledge in speaking to us and informing us. And so it is that Paul has to play catch up, so to speak, hearing from Ananias in Damascus and spending his time in prayer in Arabia. Indeed, God knits together these ordinary events into the fabric of our lives, and in them he graces us with his very own presence. It's by means of time and space and matter and on our daily walk with him to Emmaus or elsewhere that we come to be engaged by the word of the Lord so that our hearts burn. It's by means of grapes and wheat touched over time by human hands and sacramentally assumed by the Lord that we come to see who he is. But this is all in its own time and we need the actual two on the road to Emmaus. We need the very 12 who saw him on the holy mountain and at table. We need the carefully arranged words of the evangelist who researched and listened and put everything in order, for that is how God works. In their lives, in our lives, in time and in space, how could it be otherwise? For he is our true God-man, the one who ineffably was subject to his parents for a time and learned obedience, who knew when his time had not come and had come, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, and who told us to watch the signs of the times in the fullness of time and not in timeless abstractions, is he found. Thank you. We'll take a break and be back here at 1035 before we do a little commercial. We do plan to actually publish all of the papers, most of them in a fuller context than what you're hearing today in an SVS Press volume. To do that, we are looking for people who would like to be the subvention underwriters for the project. That'll take four donors at 5K, two at 10, or one at 20. So if you're interested, speak to me or contact me after the conference for those of you who are listening virtually. We'll take a break and be back at 1035. Hello, I have a question for Dr. Humphrey. I enjoyed your talk. You had to abbreviate several points of which. I'd love to hear a little more about um, the term you created, temporal docetism, and uh, basically, you know, what if you had to give an elevator pitch for what that is and, and why, why it's important. Thank you for the question. You're right, I just tossed that in. Um, so obviously docetism is this, uh, uh, is, are those doctrines that talk about Jesus simply seeming to be a human being and not actually assuming human flesh. And I think we've been very good because of the, um, the particular shape of the heresies and the questions posed um, in the early uh, centuries of the church to answer the question of physical docetism to insist that uh, Jesus actually was a human being with flesh and blood and uh, the fathers show that by talking about the things that would be scandalous like he hungers and so on. Um, but it's not been so common to talk about the possibility of, um, of ignoring the fact that Jesus actually came at a particular time and place. And so that him that I uh, quoted from the beginning from Brian Wren, uh, admits that, that's a historical fact, but then says that Jesus is no longer constrained in the way that he was then, as though the incarnation itself was a constraint. Um, 
Yes, I know we have lovely hymns in the Orthodox Church about how can it be possible that, you know, that the eternal can be held in the womb of a woman and so on. I understand that. And so we, we wonder at, with amazement at um, God's ability to be transposed, can we use them? Now I'm thinking Lewis. Or take on um, human, uh, uh, all, all that is to be human. But that means also taking on being in time. And so it's not enough simply to say Jesus actually was a flesh and blood man. It is, it is important to say also that Jesus came at a particular time and that that was God's will, that that was important, just as it was important for him to take on all uh, uh, human flesh, it was important for him to take on human temporality. And if we don't, then we can flee to something that is not quite Christian. We can flee to a religion that flattens the distinction between the Old and New Testaments, which some of the early uh, documents did. You know, Epistle of Barnabas does this. Um, thank goodness it was not uh, put into the canon, although it was very, very popular. Um, you know, although silly Jewish people, did they really think that God expected them not to eat rabbits? No, 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 no. But the rabbits are a sign of lust, and that's all that's going on there. Well, no, that isn't all that was going on there. So this idea of God working in dispensations and Jesus coming in time is very important. And if we forget that and think of him simply as... Um, uh, as the eternal principle somehow made visible to us, we're, we're missing the importance of our timeful existence. Mm. Nice. This one comes from one of our online viewers, Dr. Holliday, okay. uh, if you want to tackle this one. Does distinguishing the particular gospel incarnation from the Spirit and the Father fuel rationalism? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I think uh, an important part of my discussion was the use of the terms rational and rationalism, and in particular, the way in which uh, in the Metropolitan's book, he uses these two categories, rational or rationalistic and supernaturalistic as the two categories with which to understand the debate or the material itself. and. I sort of called into question that binary, and I think uh, when we make the distinction that the questioner implies, I mean, if you, if you distinguish between um, theological claims about uh, the spirit or about God or about the incarnation, and you draw certain conclusions from those claims, there's a sense in which you're making rationalistic deductions. What, it, what are the implications of this claim? And um, as I said in my paper, um, in my view, <clears throat> when we read scripture, or when uh, our predecessors read scripture, when, when Augustine, when uh, Justin, when uh, the fathers air their mental faculties on the reading of scripture, and if they saw that two things were in tension with each other, for example, the two genealogies, I mean, they could, they could read those two texts and see that it was impossible to synchronize those texts. And I don't know what else to call that except exercising reason or exercising your rational faculties in A, seeing the problem, and B, in trying to find ways to resolve the tension either by fusing the two texts or by saying they're irreconcilable. And for my part, um, I don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, it, it seems to me that um, Scripture itself reports, uh, you know, Jesus saying, what think you of Scripture? And the Gospels depict Jesus in dialogue with his opponents, um, arguing from scripture. Um, here's what Psalm 110 says. If Psalm 110 says this about the Lord, then it obviously can't refer to Yahweh, but it must refer to someone else. That discussion of Psalm 110 um, employs reason. The, the, uh, it depicts Jesus drawing conclusions from what the scripture says. And I think that's that's endemic to scriptural interpretation. Um, 
And so the critical question to me is, is what valence we give to the term rationalistic mm -hmm. or supernaturalistic. And um, as I pointed out, <clears throat> Schweitzer himself characterizes Rimaras as a rationalist because Rimaras sort of began the debate and incorporated those kinds of explanations to the Jesus tradition. Um, and even David Friedrich Strauss in his Das Leben Jesu, um, one of the, the, the two categories that he uses to make sense of the gospel tradition, if you look at a miracle story, he says rationalist will look at it this way, supernaturalist will look at it another way, and then what he tries to do is to pose an explanation <clears throat> that is neither rationalist nor supernaturalist. So those categories are used by people who are participating in the um, historical Jesus quest. And my question is, in the current, in our conversations, uh, either with outsiders, with, with unbelievers, with people who are not sympathetic to the Christian tradition or to the biblical tradition, and among ourselves, whether among Orthodox uh, believers or among Roman Catholic or Protestant, whether those two categories are really sufficient or even helpful in opening the discussion and advancing the discussion. So for example, if, if I assume that in talking with Edith, she's asking, well, is he a rationalist or is he a supernaturalist? <laughs> <clears throat> that that, um, that those categories are too dull, the instruments are too dull, and we need sharper instruments. We need, we need categories that are more descriptive and that that open up the discussion rather than closing down the discussion. Um, so um, um, it's, that, it's that tendency to use dichotomous categories or, or binaries in our conversations, either in analyzing the tradition or in discussing current problems. So I think, I think we just need to be more creative in finding a language that um, accommodates what I see as the complexity. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you were trying to characterize Rudolf Bultmann, um, <clears throat> I remember reading once in the Webster's Biographical Dictionary uh, on the article on Bultmann, <clears throat> and Bultmann was described as an atheist. So, <clears throat> um, but, but someone who is as pivotal as Bultmann or Schweitzer or someone else is finding language that captures their position that is appropriate to the categories which they themselves would use. May I sure, chime sure. in here? Yeah. I, I found this, um, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, I found this uh, um, both interesting and problematic. I mean, I realize that the genre of um, of his eminence's work is, 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 is such as to address people who don't have perhaps all of them, all the readership, the categories of differentiation, and so he's using words that he hopes that they, they will understand. But I, I even wonder about whether in orthodoxy the term supernaturalism actually um, works. I think that's, that's abandoning, um, abandoning uh, our worldview to a Western way of looking at things where you have the, the, the natural and the supernatural and we after all believe in the Holy Spirit who is everywhere present and who fills all things and don't make this distinction between natural grace and supernatural grace that is so common in the Western church. So that, that particular dichotomy is problematic to me. Um, as, is, um, as is traditional versus liberal, because are we talking about morals here? Are we talking about ecclesiology here? Are we talking about approach to scripture? So, so there's, there's some difficulty. I, I was very, uh, I was intrigued. I, I, I gather your grace from several comments that you're not much taken with Tom Wright. Um, but actually, in these two categories, he would be entirely on the side that you favored. 
if you accept these categories. I mean, he, he believes in the resurrection. He believes in the miracles. Um, he is completely uh, conservative on the ethical issues. So it seems to me, sorry, too far, my goodness, I'm not usually too soft. It, <laughs> it seems to me that we need several more categories if we're going to use these kind of binaries at all, and we maybe need to think. So for example, what about the distinction between a sacramental understanding of the world and, I don't know what you would say, disenchanted or flat or mechanistic understanding of how the work, world works? I mean, that would capture some of the differences. Um, one of the things about um, Bishop Wright that I think that you've rightly um, shown is his tendency to politicize or to, um, to um, make to connect it with the motives of the time, something that could be mysterious. So my objection, I, I, I love my mentor, he taught me many things, but my objection in his um, approach to apocalyptic language is that he doesn't see the mystery of it and wants to decode it uh, politically, or mostly does. He sees this as political language, and that's a carryover from, um, from G.B. Caird, his mentor. Well, I think that you've seen a similar thing in parables, but in fact, there are some things that he would have been very helpful for you in, I think your, um, your eminence, uh, for example, to actually dismantle um, and to show the difficulty in the mounting Q hypothesis, his lovely vignette of looking for the woozles in the snow going round and round and, and putting more footprints down and then following those footprints and, 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 and thinking that you found Q when you're actually only finding the results of those who came or, or the opinions of those who came before you, um, like her footprints in the hermeneutical snow that go round and round. I mean, he has some really, I think, some really good ways of looking at, say, the kind of excavation of Q that would give us three distinct layers but I, but I do think that people need to see what the scholars are doing and for that to be displayed rather than for it to be described briefly and then dismissed. Um, I, I think it's, it's really, I think, that, I think that there are those who are lay who will read and will want to really say, well, so what is it? And then you have to go and look and see at what, say, a Leif Vogue or a Kloppenborg have actually done and show where they make the missteps or where they have their, um, their misconceptions. And I think that, that that helps people to ask the question better than simply dismissal. Yep. Hello. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your effort, your great deal of effort. And um, I have a question for Dr. Humphrey. I like uh, how you inserted the um, saying of McLuhan's, as we call it, McLuhan's law, medium is the message. Oh, okay. And um, yes. my question is because I'm still wondering and I'm still looking of what is the orthodox contribution of the modern exegesis, you know? So if it is true that our medium is the inaugurative eschatology, you know, the eschatology in making, in progress, here and now, what do you think it will be the relevance and the projection of that thinking and approaching of time over the orthodox exegesis? How can we approach a biblical text having in mind that time is not linear, not circular, but it's only the, that keros, that now, you know? And how can we m have an impact on orthodox uh, or on modern exegesis as it is? Thank you. That's a lot of questions, thank you. <laughs> I, I think I'll start from the blast and just say, I don't think that orthodox would say that there is only the keros. I think we'd also say that we can observe what God has done in the Kronos. And, th and that, that that's important. I mean, we rehearse that every week in the creed, don't we? 
No? Um, we, we really do care what God has done in time for humanity. Um, and so I think it's the specific bringing together of those two things um, that, that could be a helpful approach of Orthodox readers and scholars of the scriptures. I think the other is something that was sketched out by Father Theodore Stelianopoulos in his introduction, in which he commends the bringing together of um, questions of literature, literary questions, historical questions, and theological questions, and he actually does take this again, sorry to do this, um, from Tom Wright, but then says that's not enough for an orthodox view, that's, that's a beginning, but that we also have to think of the transformative dimension of scripture. And so I think that the, what has been, I think what maybe has been the weakness in orthodox um, exegesis of scripture that we tend always to look for the spiritual and the theological could be the strength if we don't neglect those other elements of, of literary genre and um, history, historical questions as well. That we have the tendency to want to knit things together rather than to divide them up. Into, um, into bits and pieces. And we see this if you compare the, the liturgies, the typical liturgy of East and West. The West tends to celebrate the day and everything is focused on that, whereas our Eastern liturgy, though it will have a particular day that it's, it's thinking about, a particular feast it's thinking about, tells the whole story every time, every liturgy. We want to bring it all together. And I, I think that for us to be able to do that competently um, in the field of the exegesis and interpretation of scripture is really important. And for us to come along and say, yeah, you guys are saying you, you, we shouldn't be making a distinction between what the text said and what it says. That's the newest, well, it's not so new, but it's one of the newer things that's being said. And we will say, yeah, well, of course, that's right. Look at the fathers, look at how they do that. Um, look at how they don't distinguish. They, they, they're aware that it had something to say in, in a certain milieu, but they continue to see it filling up the time today. So in a way, there's more of an onus on us. We have to be able to do all the things that Western exegetes have done, show that we can do it, and then we have to show how it, is all, how it can be integrated within the understanding of the church and the living of the Christian faith. And we have to do more. Yeah, I, can I respond? Can I? This is a, I'm, I'm not orthodox, but uh, the Bishop uh, Metropolitan mentioned uh, last night that over the last several years, out of the Society for New Testament Studies, we've tried to develop uh, opportunities to foster conversation between orthodox biblical scholars and non-orthodox biblical scholars. Typically, this means East and West, but not always. And so every three or four years, we bring together a group of 50 to 75 scholars from both traditions, and we'll choose a topic, uh, the church or the Holy Spirit, and we structure those so that on a particular topic, there will be an orthodox presentation by an orthodox biblical scholar and a presentation by a non-orthodox biblical scholar, either a Protestant or a Catholic or someone else on the same topic. And then we provide 20 to 30 minutes in which we can have a plenary discussion on those two papers. And from a non-orthodox perspective, those have been immensely helpful to me to hear and to see and experience the way orthodox biblical scholars read certain texts and experience certain texts and see the theological significance and the experiential significance in certain texts in ways that I, as a non-orthodox Western scholar, simply do not. And having those conversations is eye-opening, I think, on both sides. Um, and again, I think one of the features of the Metropolitan Six Volumes is the way in which the fathers are used, because the, the use of the fathers as witnesses to the tradition um, is simply not a part of Western exegesis in the same way that it is in Orthodox uh, exegesis. And that's immensely helpful to non-Orthodox scholars in understanding the way in which these texts have been interpreted and reinterpreted by the fathers throughout the tradition. And I think those kinds of conversations 
can benefit both sides and, and really need to continue, as the Metropolitan indicated last night. Um, it's been very helpful to, to me to have students. Uh, Brew Wallace was one of our students at Emory, and he helped me to see the way in which Orthodox uh, New Testament scholars read and experienced texts in ways that I was simply unaware of. So, so I think there's a lot that Orthodox um, biblical scholarship can offer the, the conversation as a whole in terms of, of broadening the discussion, deepening the discussion, enriching the discussion. So I think there's an immense possibility for Orthodox biblical scholarship to uh, participate in this debate and to advance it.